Hello, welcome to the meeting tent, episode two. Today we're going to be talking about the hand model, and we're calling it the hand model, although it has many functions. Uh, but before we do, I just want to introduce our panel here. Uh, Lavana Tenen. Hello. Uh, Michael. Hi there. And Daniel. Hello. So, so let's hear from the source. We're going to hear Stan Tenen talking about the discovery. Uh, we should say right up front that the, the model was generated from the sequence of letters in the first verse of the Hebrew text of Genesis. We'll start with that, kind of wrap that around. And let's hear uh, what uh, Stan has to say. And what we found, and this is really quite startling, is when we simplified it mathematically, we ended up producing a form that looked just like this. And this is the form we actually made. This is a minimal geometric way to represent the way the first verse of Genesis forms itself when its letters are paired up. So if you look at this form from different directions, you can see all shadows, two-dimensional outlines of all the Hebrew letters. And we're pretty sure the same form, or some very, very closely related form, produces the Arabic letters, and a related form, but not quite the same, produces the Greek letters. And so we've got the first verse of Genesis folding itself up into a form that when you look at the form from different directions, makes all the letters in which the text is written. Here is a text written in an alphabet that curls itself up into a form that casts shadows that are the letters that the text is written in. Fruit tree yielding fruit whose seed is in itself. That is very self-embedded. That is very self-referential. That's a very reflexive process. It's creating its own letters in which it's written. Now, there is a, as you, as you all know, uh, during the Seder at Pesach, there's a song called Dayenu, which means it would have been sufficient. And it would have been sufficient if God had led us out of Egypt, it would have been, it, that would have been sufficient. It, it gave us the Ten Commandments, that would have been sufficient. So going back to the early 90s or the late 80s even, if somebody came along and said that the first verse of Genesis generated a model that cast shadows of the letters that made the model. In some ways, that would have been sufficient. And in those days, you guys could have exploited. I mean, you know, you you could have just made a living just on that discovery. But that wasn't enough for Stan, was it, Lavana? <laughs> Well, what he was looking for, you know, it wasn't enough because um, he felt that, first of all, uh, it may be counterintuitive, but if you actually examine it, in a sense, you can take any coat hanger, and he used to say this in his lectures, any coat hanger and twist it up and find forms that resemble the letters. Um, so... In order to um, in order to delve into this particular form's specialness, because it was derived um, by autocorrelating, in other words, correlating with each other, the Hebrew letters of the first verse of Genesis, um, he felt that there should be some logical way to progress from how you generate one letter to the next to the next to the next and he you know that there should be some sense behind it instead of its being kind of random really um and 
after much exploration, you know, he just couldn't find it with that original form, which was in fact something that you set in front of you and put a light and put cast shadows onto a wall. Well, that wasn't enough. Um, what was the central unifying organizing principle behind the fact that this shape could show all of the letters? Okay, I'm going to tell a story from my point of view. Several times on some of the older videos, he's told it from his own point of view. Uh, several mm -hmm. times from in his older videos, he's, he's told it from his point of view. But this is what happened to me at this at that same day. Um, we were living in a place where Stanley had his own little research den in the lower floor. And I had my office with the desk and the computer and the piles of papers on an upper floor. And so I was sitting there at my desk, you know, typing away, doing whatever it was I was doing. And all of a sudden I hear Stanley walking up the stairs wearing this gigantic smile on his face, carrying, uh, he actually, yes, had carried upstairs uh, a, an apple, a plastic ice bucket apple, which was about this big, um, on which he had outlined uh, the, the, the model shape. And then he, he stood in front of me and he gestured showing me letters and said here it is the point of it all is that this is not something this is not something which is outside of yourself to find the connection of the letters between one to the next to the next in a way that makes sense we have to be the center you have to have a human person soul as the center because what happens then is if you move the your hands and the model I'm, i guess i'm skipping ahead but whatever in a way that your gestures both echo the meaning of the letter and each hebrew letter has a specific meaning i'm sure bill will get into that at some point um then you can see that letter in your hand by the outline of the model. Um, and Stanley has demonstrated this many times on his videos, but it was a complete revelation to him and to me. It was like a, a sun exploding on the world that he'd been looking at it all wrong. Mm -hmm. that the point of the model is not something external. The point of the model is that we are the center and it needs our living being to be a part of the process in order to have it be logical and make sense. Right, okay. that's, that's beautiful. And that, that really is the essence of what we're talking about here because it's the model is just a thing. It's just, it's what it represents. That's the important part of this. But can you, can you just a, just a, Go a little further with you, Lavana. Mm -hmm. Do you remember before the hand when when he actually constructed that model? Before he knew all that, you um, know, the, and, which model the the one enclosed or the the okay? Um, yeah, the the one that he was able to cast shadows. I mean, was that something that he got excited about? You know, he, having, was, he thought it it was um, he he was not as excited but certainly excited it was a major discovery um that there was this shape which seemed to work and what he appreciated about it the most is that the tetrahedron on the outside is a a representation in its own way of absolute symmetry and the vortex model on the inside is a represent, representation of absolute asymmetry. And the modeling of these absolute, of the absolute contrast um, was what he felt was an important factor because it right. reflects the, 
the origin of everything. Okay, I, again, I'm going to get complicated here, maybe. In the, letter, in the letter Beit, which is the first letter of the Torah, That's which right. is a letter that we had come to understand as signifying the distinction between inside and outside as the first distinction in everything, either mathematically, logically, or if you think about um, our own birth, for example, the distinction between our life inside and our life outside um, is, is literally the world. Um, right. So being able to in a mathematically logical way create a model a physical model that people could actually hold and manipulate that was a uh, archetype of the contrast between symmetry and asymmetry that was what was important to him about that first model but as i say it was a step along the way but Absolutely not. The, the, to, to get to the point, we kind of had to turn it inside out. Right. Okay. And we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Uh, and, and yes, he did use the term maximum contrast in terms of describing that process. But so, so again, Michael, as the newbie, you came across the book and you started reading it and all of a sudden you're seeing this process that Stan's describing. And, and like I said, you had a, a, a pretty uh, full uh, education in, in uh, rabbinic study. So what, what was your reaction to that? That part didn't throw me as much. I saw up to the point where I understood the math and the physics of it, and then it was challenging. But I was familiar with the idea that the letters um, were moving and until time came that they got locked into the Torah that we have. Mm -hmm. So that was not new to me, that there were no spaces and, and so on. And if you've ever read the Torah from the scroll, you know that there's no punctuation, for example. And then there are random spaces and occasionally a letter would be bigger or smaller. And of course the rabbis jump all over that. Why is that there? And, and goes from there. But what fascinated me was first that he saw a pattern because I see patterns too, but from a different kind of way, not because I don't have the engineering math background that he had. And I saw something in that that came from a totally different direction the model itself was what it appealed to me and to clarify let me just share something really quick okay there were two things in his modeling in the book that drew my attention and they both relate to this kind of thing here all right so we'll, just to start with the letter olive because we talk about the letter bet as if that were the beginning of the olive bed. It's not, it's the beginning of the Torah. But prior to that, the singularity, the oneness is reflected by the olive. And if you um, took that, because it's made up of a yud above and a yud below and above in the middle, and you move that yud down to here, Suddenly, I was looking at a shape that was remarkably similar to his flame in the tent. And I came to that shape another way. But here's the key. I went to, I imagine that shape in the middle of a circle, and he's got an almost identical picture in the book, except there's a bet in the middle, which is fine. And in my meditations, I saw it go from an Aleph to a Bet to a Gimel to a Dawad and do exactly what he was talking about, except I was doing it in my mind. There were no shadows because I didn't have a model. But I began to move and then back to here. And so it really began here with the Bet. Had I had a model of this, 
I could have sort of twisted it and unfolded it into exactly the shape of your model, uh, which normally you have kind of, when people hold it up, they normally don't hold it with the point up, they hold it with the point sideways for some reason, I guess, because we're imagining putting our hand in it. But that was the, the thing that got my attention, that this was a, not random, as Lavana said earlier, where you could take a hanger and twist it into a different shape. Okay. Well, but he didn't do it that way. He produced it mathematically. And here I was getting it meditatively, but I'm getting the same shape. Mm -hmm. And I called it the flame. And anybody who looked at it, said, oh, it's a flame. Except for a couple of people, one pregnant lady saw that it was a, <laughs> a pregnant shape with a big belly on it, but it was right. the same shape. And I said, okay. And then I read, and this is right at the beginning in his introduction, where he wrote, the geometric metaphor provides, as it were, the transport vehicle for the personal experience of the transcendent. Hmm. Now, we're right on the eve of the Shavuot holiday that we're recording this, which deals with what's called in Kabbalah, Ma'asem Merkava, the chariot. That's a chariot. That was the word he used, his transport vehicle. And I'm thinking, okay, this is what I was doing meditatively. And he came at this from the opposite side, from the mathematics. But it was the same idea of a transport vehicle. And that was what he was ultimately looking for, was a way of meditatively, and you'll talk about it next time also, with the applications of using that shape. Not to just discover the alphabet, you're right. That would have been enough, dayenu. Mm -hmm. Except that Dayenu doesn't mean if God only did that, I would have been satisfied. That would have been enough. What it means is that would have been enough to be grateful to God. If he just right. did this, it would have been enough to be grateful. But right. if he did all of those, imagine how grateful we would be. And that's the sequence in Dayenu. We, we sometimes forget that. All right, Dayenu, let's move on and eat because it's right before the eating. <laughs> so... But here was a transport vehicle, a Merkava, that took us somewhere. I had come to it by, where was it going to take me? He was building the car. <laughs> I was driving the car. He was building the car, but it was the same car. Right. And that's what blew me away. And I said, I got to talk to this guy. Yeah. <laughs> I have to talk to him. So we're, we're going to get more into that as we get into the applications in our uh, next episode. But that, that, that's really amazing. Uh, and, and so uh, we'll talk more about that. Uh, I love that image, though. Um, Daniel, somewhere along the line, <laughs> you discovered this or came across your, your consciousness or whatever. And so I'm curious about... Uh, based on your background uh what did you see what did this do how were you affected oh well, so I, i'm talking about know, i'm talking about the model specifically yeah yeah so i mean i'm you know lucky and honored that stan himself showed it to me the first time i ever saw it uh in your in your mm -hmm. uh, kitchen mm -hmm. over uh, i think a cup of sake or something i don't know it's really oh, it nachos was... maybe uh it was uh always a great way to introduce anyone to deep ideas mm -hmm. uh and um, saki, saki saki is another form of transport vehicle i think <laughs> yeah well yeah we could go a lot a lot of different directions with that but uh <laughs> but it was just it was so sweet meaning you know i mean one of the things this may i don't know if this is this is maybe not appropriate but i think it's really amazing one of the first things we learn um about uh, abraham uh is that he, it, it's not such as he taught people, he, he gave them food, he washed their feet, you know, so memories of Stan introducing the hand model are paired with him mm -hmm. feeding me and being magnanimous, and then he would feed the animals, and like, you know, and he loved the little, all the animals, he had hundreds, if not thousands of animals coming through the backyard of this beautiful forest, uh, it, so, so it's not, you know, it's within a context, which, which, which is, I just want to explain that it's not just 
there's something more. I had the honor to kind of see the entire context of, of his giving this idea, which I know he took for granted, uh, of course, uh, but it's uh, wonderful to remember that. Um, Dan, so there, Dan, Dan showed me the model and he, he did some gestures and he kind of went through this uh, explanation. And then he showed me the, like the, the six hand model that makes the fruit. And that's what really got me because I know that a fruit is an internal process, meaning there's a seed, a seed in the fruit that creates a tree that then creates creates the fruit, which and it's this cycle. And as I think Lavana and uh, Michael mentioned, like that's the, that's our lives mm -hmm. going from inside to outside to inside to outside and back and forth. And so uh, that's very significant in many disciplines of thought, including music, of course, mm -hmm. uh, and but many many disciplines disciplines of thought and especially in spirituality that's kind of the key and something which has either the outside or the inside but not both is it's maybe can be nice for different people but it's kind of insignificant I think cosmically and so when Stan showed me this this process I remember he showed me the process it goes you know what's inside comes out and becomes outside then becomes back in and becomes the inside um, I I didn't know I didn't understand it like um technically but i went whoa there that is something absolutely mind-blowing and then the fact that it fits on your hand and that you can image it in your mind and use it to interface with other worlds and with with inner worlds it's not like other worlds like i'm watching star trek which i love but like it's like it's not like that kind of other worlds it's like other worlds that have to do with you that you didn't even know existed and they're called hebrew letters and each one opens you up to these new possibilities and uh, also opens you up, <laughs> you know, not only in terms of learning the language or the ideas, but also in, in terms of understanding yourself. And so um, it's, again, so that, that's my, that's what's super impressed me. It's kind of hard to give the whole thing, but that's what really, right, right, really just right. got, got my attention. I went, well, this is something really special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and, and so what we're learning is that we're, we're showing a model that represents many things, but as Lavana, all of you kind of pointed out that it has uh, internal and external qualities. And so that's something we want to explore. And uh, next episode, we'll get more into it, uh, in turn, in, including the actual hand gestures. and some of the other uh, aspects of what this model represents. Now, again, we're calling it the hand model, but it is so much more than that. Uh, is there anything else anybody wants to say before we close for today? Otherwise, we will be with you in our next episode. Again, we welcome your comments, criticisms, if there's ways we can improve this, and if uh, anybody wants to come on as a guest, we will consider that. And uh, I'll leave the contact information at the end. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.